out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. Hi everyone. I love the way how Meet Me in the Field seems to go on a certain path at stages, and we end up with a few episodes in a similar vein. I did not switch episodes around. I post them in the order that I recorded them. It's not only because I'm OCD, but because it feels like the way to keep it authentic. We are on this journey together, and I do not want to take you on the path which I feel you have to be on. We go where we are taken. I mention this because today we have our second episode in a row where I chat with a minister. As I mentioned in the previous episode, I went out looking for ministers or pastors to talk to, just because I thought it could be interesting to hear about their journey as well. I initially met Anthony while at the dinner to celebrate the cat lady that he's cursed his eight years of being clean and sober. She chatted to us in episode 13. I then only knew that Anthony was a breeder of Sphinx cats. It was only when he conducted a funeral that I attended to, also strange enough cursed his grandmother's funeral, when I realized there was far more to this man than meets the eye. When I asked Anthony to speak to me, I started off by making the statement, so you are religious. His reply was something in the line of, if that is what you want to call it. I was immediately intrigued. After all, this was a minister who just led a funeral service using a Bible to read from, and he implies that he's not religious? That proved that there is far more to Anthony than I imagined. So, I knew then that I just had to have Anthony on Meet Me in the Field. Fortunately, he agreed, and here we are. This podcast is supported by the first layer, the 12-step workbook on working through the 12 steps in any addiction in 21 sessions. There is also a 24-day coaching and counselling program available based on the first layer. For more information in this regard, go to www.freddy.org.za and click through from the notices at the right of the homepage. Sit back and enjoy. Anthony, good morning. How are you doing? Morning. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you so much for joining me and meet me in the field, our podcast about spiritual journeys. I know nothing about you, <laughs> which makes this always exciting. It's interesting that the first f- many episodes that I recorded were people that I knew well. And now I've, I'm starting to run out of people I know well, so now I need to, to look wider. And I know you from a dinner that we attended together, yes. firstly, and I didn't realize that you were, how can I call it? Because you don't, do you call yourself a minister? Yeah, pastor. Pastor. Same, okay. same similar <laughs> Some, Something semantics. like that. So I didn't realize that you were a pastor then, and the next time I ran into you was at a funeral. And that was when I asked you if you would talk to me, and you willingly agreed. So thank you very much. Really appreciate that. You are freshly back from China. Correct. So except for being a pastor, you are also a, what do I call it, cat judge. Yeah, international cat judge. International. Amongst amongst many other things. Cat judge. That's an interesting combination. And are you over your jet lag? Yes, totally. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, so you won't fall asleep during the chat. Can't promise. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, are you from Cape Town? Um, the last 20 years, 25 years. Okay, you from that, Cape Town. <laughs> before that, we, I was born in Durban and we moved around a lot when I was in primary school. So I call myself a Cape Townian, but I've lived in all the provinces and, but, and all over the country, but it was a long time ago. From Dad's work? Or? Yeah, he was in regional management, so promotions meant a new region, which meant... Up and go, so back, every back and 18 go. months to two years we, we moved oh provinces for, for a while. So, And how did you find that as a job? How did you adapt to that? Well, not too badly. It was some of them easier than others. One or two moves were tough when you left good friends behind. Yeah. Um, or you just started making friends and you start over. But I think as a kid you adapt quite quickly. But the one deal that we had as a family was high school would be in one place. We wouldn't okay. move high school, so... I stayed in Cape Town for seven years while my sister and I were at high school, and then after we matriculated, he, he moved again, but we, we stayed. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, at some stage, you need that bit of stability, hey? Huh? Yes, yes. But I think the young year, it's not ideal, but it's easier when you're yeah. younger. It's easier to make friends, easier to adapt. Um, the older we get, the more fussy and stayed in our ways. <laughs> Do you feel as if you've kept any scars because of 
emotional scars, I mean. No, I don't think so. Is it? No. Not that I not that I can not that you're aware of. No. Let's chat for long enough and I'll give you a few. <laughs> I'm sure I've got plenty. <laughs> My job is to look for them. <laughs> And trust me, I shall find them, you won't have to whether they're real or imagine, imaginative, imaginative in my head. <laughs> <laughs> now then you all got scars. Remember, so. I need to make a living. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I identify those scars, is how I do it. Yeah, identifying is not the problem, it's healing them. Yeah, I hear you. Listen, Anthony, and how were you as a teenager? Oh, oh, pretty average, I guess. I was very, very quiet. I wasn't overly popular. I wasn't overly unpopular. Got on with everybody, so I probably wasn't part of the in crowd, but I wasn't out of the in crowd. We had a, a like a bunch of guys at school, so you know we're always always around. And if you're around, you're invited anyway. If you weren't around, you yeah. weren't. So okay. Um, so yeah, I think sort of middle of the road would be the right. You know, so not attitude. dark and moody. And I broody. wasn't dark and moody, and I wasn't <laughs> overly um, popular or so. Okay. You know, I was. I was at a boys' school, so sport was important, and I think I was captain of my, every second team I played in. Um, so I wasn't quite a first team player, but I, I wasn't quite okay. fourth or fifth or sixth team. So rugby, cricket, of, and all those things. Yeah, uh, I was hockey, hockey, okay, hockey nice. basketball were more my thing, and a little bit of cricket. Okay. So I was too scrawny for rugby. I didn't know there was basketball in South African schools. Yeah, certain the schools. Okay. Um, I'd come from Durban, where there it was a, a major. Sport and in Cape Town, high schools, some of the high schools play. So okay. We played there and it was good fun. And in terms of religion, spirit in your house where you grew up, how do they call it, your family of origin? Yeah. <laughs> my family were, were believers uh, or Christians in, in a very, I don't say loose sense, but they, they believe, but we moved a lot. So with every move, they'd try and find a church, but it would be whatever's closest and um, there were times I think they were quite strong and times where things were since when you find a nice church they were very involved but there were other times when weren't very you know, okay. so. and then I know when we kind of came down it took my folks a long time before they got involved in, in church so we had a, a definite spiritual grounding but it wasn't a very um, strong uh, overly strong okay it was just a, a very normal I guess South African sort of upbringing where and no attachment to a specific denomination? No. Our parents had their preference, but no, it was more. Okay. Um, so I guess that, that formed a lot of the journey I'm on. Um, so, so yeah, there wasn't, it wasn't a strong denominational attachment. Um, okay. But more of a stylistic a church that fitted there, you know, which did fit into one or two genres. But I think as a, a child, I must have been to three or four different denominations at different times. And did religion resonate with you is it something that you from hearing about baby jesus you believed in it or was it times of questioning and not knowing and all those type of things no, i guess i believe i believe it, growing up it was a uh, it was you know it's just that's the way we were brought up and then as a teenager at some point in there decided for myself in terms of um, the journey uh, so i don't that I think I went to a point where I didn't believe, but I definitely wouldn't say I was a, a very strong um, believer in high school. I, mean, I was grounded and I believed, but it wasn't it wasn't everything. But it was yeah. it was just part of my life and part of what we accepted. And so yeah, I guess we did feel quite strongly about it, but we weren't overly. You know, so okay. um, I think around since seven eight, I decided to go to church myself in the evenings, and you know, okay. but that again was very. Very much socially based, more than you know, spiritual based. So it sounds as if you were very much allowed to make your own choices. Very much. Yeah. Okay, so never the religion of enforced upon you. No. Okay. No, 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 never. Obviously, as a kid, if we were if my folks went to church. We we have to go with them. Go with them. But then again, when we hit standard three, standard four, those days, grade five, six, it was our choice. And if we didn't want to go, we didn't have to. Okay. And there was definitely a long period where we, I didn't go. Um, and they were okay with that? Yeah, well, I'm sure they were hoping I would go, but <laughs> no, they, there wasn't any pressure to you. Okay. At all. Cool. So what happened after school? After school? Um, well, I guess for me, somewhere during that eight, that nine, I got very involved in a church, and probably that's where my journey started in, in earnest. 
where things changed from just being something I, I believed into something I felt quite strongly about. Okay. Um, so, in the eight, we went on a youth camp, and, and that was the partic- probably a turning point if I look back. Before that, I was heading to UCT, and I was going to do a business science degree, and, you know, I had a sort of journey planned out, and after that, I, I, you know, I just said a prayer, and I felt, I said, whatever God's plans are more than mine, and I yeah. didn't think they would change anything. Uh, you know, when I said it, I thought it was just a, but I... I <laughs> a few I, lines. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but I, no, I just felt a, a sense being able to, of laying aside and saying, you know what, it's not about what I want. Yeah. If there's something else or a, a different journey, then then show the way. And on hindsight, that prayer probably changed many things because it was an earnest, heartfelt. You know, through our lives we say many things, but that it's one of those memories that came at, at the time. I felt it was, and so yes, yeah, so that leads to the end of school because then I, I it was more a case of feeling I wasn't supposed to go to UCT. Uh, I felt I needed to to go to some sort of college or Bible college. But what I knew about Bible college is I didn't really want to go. I'm not, we're not very traditional and I'm not very, um, I guess what's the, we're not, they're not that conservative. So I found a lot of the Bible colleges that I knew about were either very denominational, uh, very much about one organization and their beliefs, or were very strict and conservative and that didn't fit who I was or our beliefs. So I took a year off. I was doing a lot of work with Scripture Union which with? is Script Union, which is basically a youth, ca- um, youth camping and schools education. Okay. So I'd spent two years working school holidays with them and running camps for them. And so we did everything from Froggy Pond, which is for underprivileged children, to okay. tent camping for teenagers and leadership training. From And so it was a, a full range of things. And so I, I joined a team that it was a year of your life program where you gave a year and you went to work for them. Uh, okay. I don't think you paid to work, but that's fine. And the idea with that was just to make sure, because I wasn't going to go to to a college just for the sake of going. And I used that time to go to a few, and we went to a few open days and a few things, and I found a college that really just resonated. And again, the second I walked in, I knew it was somewhere I needed okay. to go. I had no idea what I was going to do there in terms of, luckily when I joined, there was only really one or two streams to, to choose between. So there wasn't, it wasn't like... It is now where you, when you go in, you have to choose your stream right in the beginning. It was a, a very general approach. You did everything, and then you specialized as you went through. And um, so, yeah, after after a year with Script Unions, camping and schools work and a general bit of everything, went to did a three-year BA course in education, or theology uh, course, in majoring in education, missions, and some psychology. Okay. So, yeah, that was a... Three years, uh, got a Stellenbosch degree through it. It was a Stellenbosch satellite school, which was quite nice. Okay. It was, they called multi denomination not interdenominational. So it was a mix of, of everything. So you would, so any lecture or any discussion was what everyone believed, all the different beliefs, and you got to choose yourself, particularly, obviously with, within a Christian sense, but they didn't speak about one denomination or, okay. one, or one way. So there are one or two things that, Churches have different views on, and they were very clear on making sure that all sides were were presented equally, and you had a yeah. choice to see where you fitted in or what you what you thought. Which so it sounds as thing. if something that you don't like is to be boxed. Definitely not. No, no. Uh, I think th- there there has to be freedom in in choice. I don't definitely don't believe in anything being dictated or or anything like that. So, but at the same time, I do. Th- also feel their clear guidelines. So there's certain lines we don't cross, but there's certain lines that if we don't know the answer to, who are we to dictate our theory or thoughts? So, yeah. so it's, I guess the difference comes in with what we consider as absolute or consider as fact and what we consider as theory or okay. our interpretation. There's certain things that are interpretation-based and there has to be room for flexibility there because we can, with all... With all honesty and with all good integrity and, and best of intentions, we can sometimes still be wrong. Yeah. So we've got to leave room for that. Um, so for me, that's a, a big issue. So yes, in that way, I won't be, I won't be boxed in if it's not something that's absolute. Yeah. Um, there are a few absolutes, not many, but there are a few. So generally, what I understand from what you're saying or what I'm hearing or what my head is telling me is the world is changing. 
and we need to adapt to a changing world. We need to grow with that. We need to be able to always, but without changing our fundamentals. The fundamentals, so yeah. There's certain things that are fundamentally true, but how we apply them. So I guess let's take an easy, simple one. Music. Music 60 years ago was very different in, in church, and there's some churches who still believe that music is the only way to do things. Yeah. And I think they've they're wrong that you know that music isn't fundamentally something that can't change and adapt and yeah. you do have to, so in that way there's certain aspects of who we are i don't listen to organ music in the car and i don't think many people do so <laughs> i don't see why on a sunday i've got to go and listen to organ music if it's yeah. not what i you know again there's nothing wrong with that but there is something wrong if we exclude all other music and say there's only one kind of music so that was one of the areas the church many years ago, I think, have dealt with that majority of them anyway. But that was a huge shift for some yeah. people. And there's some people that haven't made that shift. But that's one of the easier issues. Cause it, but it's, I like it as an example because it doesn't have too many connotations. It's yeah. quite a simple, clean, easy. Uh, I go through. Well, I grew up Dutch Reformed okay. with organ music and very serious music. And you do a mini. Yes. And it was all very, very serious and very under undertoned yes no it's toned down and very dragged out yes and i often wonder how my belief system would have been different had i grown up in a black american community with those big voices and lively choirs would have been radically different. i think it's amazing i love that music yes. those voices oh wow but you you would you'd be throwing with different issues yeah. you know so in different, <laughs> different aspects um but yes, I, if I had a choice of those, I definitely know which one I would prefer to yeah. be brought up in. But a lot of my friends, a lot of the guys who spent time with us over the years came from a Dutch reform background because we did things so differently. Yeah. Um, some people struggled with that, but most felt the freedom within that. So, yeah. And that's important, that there's a freedom rather than a obligation or a sinister or, or guilt and mm -hmm. negative, um, side of things. And so talk about music, is this your guitar standing in between us? Yes, it's my guitar, but no, I don't know how to play. Um, no! For many years I, I've I wanted... I saw you as a... No, <laughs> the heart's there, the fingers and the mind's not. So um, I, I know enough to be a rock star, I know three chords, but I don't know them well enough to even be a rock star. Um, <laughs> so over the years I have... Actually, I think that could be my wife's guitar, she plays the bass. She's more musically inclined, so... I have tried, but never hard enough, and never stuck at it long enough to to really. I tried to teach really myself good. the piano. Oh God, it just no. No, I'm not self-disciplined enough. Unfortunately, no, I, for music's never been my strong point. Um, as much no. as I wish it was, um, it would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> but um, I've never been musically inclined. No, neither am I. But that's also growing up. My family was never musically inclined, and both listening to music and playing music was never a big thing. So. By the time I started enjoying music, it was probably a bit late in life too. I know it's never too late. But, um, <laughs> and singing? I can't sing. Is it? No, I can't sing. I love singing, but I have no ear whatsoever. <laughs> what did my husband once say? You don't have a bad voice, but your ear is terrible. <laughs> and I know it. I oh. never know where the note is. <laughs> okay, so now you finished studying. And what happens now? Again, it was difficult because I went studying saying I wouldn't go work for a church. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And I've learned not to say that anymore. Okay. So um, the idea was I was going to go and work in non-profit or what we call the parachurch organizations, the schools, ministries, the youth work. Because okay. that that's where I had my experience and that's why I was actually relatively good at what I was doing and enjoyed it and it seemed the logical way to go. Yeah. And... Again, three months before I graduated, there, someone phoned and asked if I'd go for an interview. At a church. At a church. And again, it was one of those things that as they asked, I knew I'd, something I had to do. And again, call that um, an inner voice or... God's will. God's will or, or you know, spirit speaking to you. or It was just the sense that I had to go for the interview. Um, so I went and it was fine. It was very arbitrary in terms of... Oh, well, it was a whole committee and all the rest of it, but they were quite excited, but they wanted me for three months to do a youth program. And everything that I believed in and had studied on 
relationships, because we're very relationally orientated, um, is that it takes a year or two to build trust, let alone start a program. So although if you're not committed for a long-term process, then a three-month contract would be a waste of time as such. But again, I had a sense that I needed to take it, and that was difficult because I said logic was telling me it was a bit crazy. Yeah. Um, so I, I went for the three months and started a, started the ball rolling on a lot of things. And then what they really needed was someone just to start, an outsider to come in and, and, and start something. And again, I just had a sense that at the end of that, they'd hire me full time. And they said they definitely can't. That wasn't in the budget or part of their process. But I said, that's fine. And I signed a three-month contract. While I was studying, I worked nights. I studied in the day and I worked at night at the Spur as a waiter. So at the end of, just before the end, I actually left early, wrote my exams early. I got special permission. I took a three-month contract to go to New Zealand and we opened a franchise there okay. with a group of 10, 15 guys. So we were just the labor, but, you know, uh, it was a, I had friends in New Zealand and there was a good motivation to go. And well, that's exciting. So, yes, yeah, so I signed that contract and I knew after my three months I was going to be heading to New Zealand for three months and a week into New Zealand contract that phoned me and said when when I was finished came back they offered me a full time job so I that was, church you can't say they ju- can't afford it and that yeah. it's not so in a long term plan I then became um, a full time youth and schools worker for the church ok um, so that's exactly what you wanted to do yes or philosophically it was exactly what yeah, you it was it was just in a okay. different setting and I, and I said well as long as I'm going <clears> to <throat> preach or be a, a minister then that would be fine and cake like on snow but um <laughs> It was part of the process, and so I joined there and on full-time staff and got involved, very involved in the school as part of the relationship building and the outreach. Um, church wasn't always excited about me being there involved in the school, but it was it was how we built the relationships that started started everything going and, and working there. Okay. Yeah, so that's pretty much, that was the start. And what was the next step? That's a long, complicated story. Um, <laughs> Uh, as with most youth ministers in churches that aren't used to having a youth or especially I guess in that sort of time period which 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago it was still a new sort of era so I think I was fired twice and then rehired um, <laughs> and the second time I was rehired to save face you know they said there, there wasn't enough work for a youth full-time youth worker was their official excuse or part of the process but a lot of it was just misunderstanding. As I said youth works very different to and very relationally orientated, and it's very difficult to quantify. And we had lots of kids coming and doing part of programs. Not many joining the church because the church hadn't changed as such. Ah. Um, so we're still playing. So we were getting a few, and we were making huge progress. But there were certain people who weren't overly excited about the the concept. Uh, and of course, young people came to. We were in Camp Bay, and young people came from the beach to church and. People thought they mm. weren't dressed appropriately and all that sort of stuff. So not that they were there in their costumes, but it was your usual transition sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so then, I, you know, then I became an associate pastor, which was, a, as I said, more just a fancy way of of rehiring us. And so I was an associate, but I picked up just picked up more departments and more work, um, and which again was part of the journey we're on because eventually I had a very broad understanding. You know, I, I ran most departments in the church for at least three to six months, oversaw different areas. So w- without realizing, I was getting a lot of experience in a, across the whole spectrum okay, yeah. of, of church and leadership and, and how it ran and how it worked. And on hindsight, it was frustrating at the time because it felt like I was doing far too much um, of one thing and not enough time for the stuff we really were supposed to. Um, and we were juggling... A lot of things. So you're pushing paper instead of saving souls. No, no, it was about building relationships. So for us, this has been very the focus has been building relationships. Okay. So it was spending time with the wrong people, if that makes sense. So people we already had a relationship, we already knew, and were already part of the, of the church, and not spending time with people who we wanted to get to know and to to able to speak to, yeah. and and help within life situations. So we ran, as we ran courses and. At, at the school, we ran all sorts of things in terms of life skills programs and things. You know? So that was very much where we, we were at and did a lot of counseling. 
So it was it was good, but it was um, but it was a good foundation. And then after four or five years there, probably for the wrong reasons, but again we see that as a, a God issue, not a, a, a man issue. We were asked if we would start our own church, um, which is something we also said we'd never do. But Who are the, we? At I was at that stage I was married. Okay. To, to Teresa, where I got married to during during that process, and she had moved in and she had started working as the administrator. Okay. So she was running the office and coordinating all the groups. Okay. So then I was asked if I'd consider starting a new church. And again, it was a, it was something that was quite popular at the time, was was called church planting, but starting something new in a new area with a group of people and, you know, um, seeing it grow. So there were some people who were very excited about that and some people who just saw it as a way of, of helping us move on. And... Again, at the time, we just knew it was the right move, even though it was a plan we had for about 10, 20 years down the line. We said maybe one day, but again, as soon as it was offered, even though I knew the, the person offering it wasn't, probably had, didn't have the best motivations behind the offering, I knew it was the right answer for, for that stage. Okay. And then I had a small team of five or six people who wanted to come with us, and so I guess that becomes the we, and we started a church in the gardens area okay. that was 2002 oh, lovely. and so yeah, we started with seven people and nothing and just a lot of enthusiasm and and yeah we grew from there and we were there for oh, what's it about 15 16 years oh wow okay so that's where the daughters were born yes they how well, old are they both now? my kids were born during that season they 13 and 10. Okay. So about two and a half year gap between the two. So yeah, they were all born in during that process. Um, and we've got, we actually had, ended up having a church with a lot of small kids, which was great. I think we had one stage we had 45 people and 22 babies born oh, in, two wow. year, in a two year period. So it was... Fertile ground. <laughs> it was a fun season with lots of challenges, but it was good fun. You know? so, again, it was more just a case of that was the age group of, of people yeah. who we were relating to and were coming through. We were, which was quite nice, we also had, which is what our goal from the beginning was, we had three or four generations that used to come on, you know, it was, so there was an old age home up the road, and we had a, a car full of old grannies that used to come, and they used to feel at home, and we had a, a lot of kids who felt at home, um, and a lot of people came, young adults came with their, with their newborn babies, and their mothers and fathers yeah. actually joined the church as well, so oh, it was cool. quite Unexpected. We thought we'd be, you know, having a new church. We thought it'd be a lot of young people, and it, we were probably half. It was our main area, but it was amazing how many people brought their parents, and we were, we were very comfortable having multi generational, yeah. which is what we wanted. You know, didn't want to be a. So that was a message. So that was a very nice season, and you know that that we had. What type of church was it? Was it a non denominational? What what would you call it? The church I had been involved in was a united church, which okay. is supposed to be two of the major denominations, Methodist and Presbyterian, was there. No, it was um, Congregational and Presbyterian. But they were a unique church, though, only church in, the, in that setup. We also had a Methodist church united. And it goes back to the history of the area they were in. Two churches, one had a building, one had a pastor. They were struggling, and they were talking 50, 60 years ago. So they combined forces and the Methodist and Presbyterian Church in Camps Bay became one church. Cause, okay. And then they later joined the Congregational. So they were a bit of a mix. And when we planted, we didn't want to plant within one of those three, um, purely because of the logistical factors. One of the groups wanted me to restudy my exact degree at the exact same university, but under them, which just seemed pointless. <laughs> um, since I already had the degree, yeah. um, to go and restudy it seemed a bit of a waste of time and money. One of the other groups there, particular philosophy was before you could be in a church by yourself, you had to spend three years working in a different region with a different cultural group, which again was fine, but we had already started a church, so to close it down to go in. And then the other group we, we went with for a while, but it just didn't feel right. Um, so we were at that stage linked to our home church with a mandate to find a covering body before we were released. So, so we were... For three years, we were seen as just a department of, with a goal of after three years becoming independent. And by okay. that stage, so and then we joined a group called the Vineyard, 
which is an association of churches, and again also that fitted our theology and our beliefs and very much on paper who who we are um, just resonated very much with them. So it was an American-based group originally that started with, on with all the hippies on the beach in the 60s and it was, again, they were famous for coming to church with jeans and Hawaiian shirts on because at the time that was, I guess, what was modern. Um, yeah. <laughs> whereas most of the churches were still suit and ties. So they were seen as as different for that reason. But um, so yeah, and also very music based um, and very relational based and as opposed to liturgy and structure. So yeah, there's a lot more freedom and, the, and also they had a lot more scope. You didn't have to fit into one mold um, okay. as much as your core beliefs and your theology was more important than your practice. So they had churches ranging from quite conservative looking from the outside to churches that look quite quite charismatic on the uh, as well. So um, and so there was a, a lot of scope to be who you be, okay. to be who you who you were as opposed to a lot of the, the groups say are a bit like a franchise, not in a bad way, but saying this is what we believe, yeah. this is how we do things. And if you walk into a Dutch Reformed church in Caledon or you walk into one in Pretoria, in theory, you're going to get a very similar atmosphere um, is what a lot of the churches feel. Um, and again, I think the good news is things are changing. Um, and it's not so much that anymore, but 20 years ago, it very yeah. and we didn't feel like we related to many of the groups. Yeah. Um, we were somewhere in the middle. If I think Dutch Reformed, looking at my mom's church that she attends in Johannesburg and my brother's one that he attends in Durbanville, yes. they are vastly different. Yes, which in, is. It, 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 it's quite amazing to, 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 to think something, something that was so structured and the same is now so. Well, there's such, such a such lot a of churches to be different. have seen that value. In the, and again, yeah. are we, again, we're talking 20, 25 years ago when this was all happening. And in the last 20 years, churches have changed quite, yeah. I mean, a lot more open. So there are a lot of churches, I mean, the church I grew up in, which was 30 years ago, used to have a traditional morning service that, with hymn books and, and all sorts of stuff. And then the evening would have a, a more informal service with a band. And oh, okay. in those days, it was an overhead projector, was, was, was modern. Um, <laughs> the good old days. The good old days. So, and a lot of that has come through in a lot of the groups now where they've realized that to reach different people, that the message is what's important, not the exactly. the method um, yeah. in terms of all the format, and you can be open to to both. Um, so a lot of that's changed for the be best, which is, which is good. Cool. Yeah. Now, when I met you at the funeral, yeah, you used a term, or or you you questioned a term that I used. And since then, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I hear that term being used differently a lot as well. And that's, I said to you, so you're a Christian. Yes. And you said if that's what you want to call it, or something like that. You asked if I was considering myself religious. Ah, yes. And I said no. And again, it's, it, look, it's one of my little phrases, because it always starts a conversation, which is, which is good. Definitely. But, um, <laughs> uh I th religious in my mind it goes back to where people when, if I say I'm re religious then the immediate connotation people have is pews organs church every Sunday suits ties yes. or sort of the way many people grew up in school or in, in South Africa anyway was seeing churches as a religious um, thing and for me my definition of re religion across the board is someone who follows a set of rules or guidelines or statutes to appease or please a higher power. So for me, religious is, is trying to live by the rules to keep God happy. And there are many Christians and denominations that I think are religious, as well as many other groups. Or, But for me, I was never attracted to religion. It's never been something that comes naturally to me. But for me, we use the phrase, when I'm in a relationship with God. So okay. because of a, I do... I do what I do and um, behave the way I do because of a relationship, not because of rules. Oh. And I guess it's the same way it should be in marriage. I don't, I'm not faithful to my wife and try and make her happy and good to her because I made promises 20 years ago. 
and I've got to live by them. It's because I love her, and so therefore I want what's best for her. Yeah. I don't obey my father purely because he's my father, and because he says so I will do it. We have a good relationship, and if he offers advice, um, I'll listen to it. And there are certain things that we do, even though we don't really want to, because we respect and we love them. So yeah. it's done out of not out of obedience or out of obligation, but out of love and relationship. Okay. So for me, that's when I speak about my spiritual journey or my religion as such, it's about a relationship with God, and everything I do is because of that relationship, not because of a set of laws or rules ah. um, as such. So for me, that's when people say, are you religious? I see them thinking, do you follow rules because you have to? Um, okay. And no, I, yeah. I don't. Um, but at the same time, I believe they're there for a reason, that, and that if they were created in love, um, therefore they, we respect them in, yeah. out of that relationship. No. If my dad tells me, is it, well, I'm a dad now, so if I tell my kids when they're small <laughs> not to put their fingers in the plug hole, it's not because I want to spoil their fun, it's because, and it, I guess maturity comes when you start realizing that when you're told not to do something, or it's normally because someone wants what's best for you, yeah. if you've got that right relationship with them. Um, so True. obviously things go pear-shaped when people don't, if it's not a right relationship and not every boss and every person wants what's best for you. Um, but in an ideal family or in the right situation, that's what it is. So, so yeah, I don't, we often I often tell people we're not religious. And that is because we don't follow things because we have to or because we told to. We do it because it's right and because it's out of relationship. So Nice, I like that. So, yeah, so that's, that, that's where we come off with the we're okay. not religious um, as such. Cool. I've got to, I know somebody also says, use the term God follower. Yes. Um, he's not, I don't think he, I think he doesn't like the word Christian. He doesn't like to call himself a Christian, he likes to call him rather a God follower. And um, that's just also, also I find interesting. So, yeah, a lot of it's semantics, but often the words we, or the values we put to a word affect how we behave or how yeah. we see things. So sometimes the problem is because I've got issues with the word that actually helps other people not understand it. Um, because I'm so adamant that I'm going to call something something else because of my history or my journey mm. or my scarring. But at the same time, I think it's important to know that we change words to create conversations so people understand, so we don't just assume. You know, yeah. So too many times we have words that as soon as we say them, people just assume they put you in a box or understanding. And and so sometimes semantics are important just to create a conversation yeah. as opposed to... A huge definition oh, yeah, yeah. Um, as such. Makes sense. Now, at what stage did cats enter your life? Because <laughs> oh. like, is it the cat I'm hearing playing? Yeah. playing? <laughs> yes, it's probably one of my kittens. Um, it started again just as something different. We, our life was very involved in a church setting because I worked for the church, my wife worked for the church. They didn't pay us very much, so part of the deal was they gave us accommodation on the property of the church. So our life was very much centered in one space, which yeah. wasn't healthy. And so I've always loved animals and of any sort or nature. Um, and then when I got married, my wife made the mistake of saying she, she wanted a cat. Um, and I said, fine. Um, <laughs> a life-changing decision. <laughs> yeah, sort of. What, so, one of those arbitrary things you say one day and you look back 20 years later and say, oh, what yeah, happened? <laughs> possibly regrets it, I'm not sure. Um, but she bought a magazine when we were on a honeymoon about different breeds and an international magazine. And that's when I got introduced to the weird and wonderful cats, which are the ones that I'm, I'm more inter interested in, things that are quite different. But it started off as just something to do that where we could meet people that the conversations weren't always about the same thing. So it was to meet new people and also just to have a different social circle yeah. outside of, just said, um, I was very sporty, my wife wasn't, so that didn't help. So it was a way to just get some sort of interest that was outside of Fantastic, our immediate yeah. circle and that was yeah that's where it all started and just grew from there and got See, more and more involved so you breed one type of cat or more than one currently mainly one kind of cat okay. i breed the the hairless sphinx Ooh. which is supposed to be the friendliest cat and most dog-like cat <laughs> in the world which is why i like them and then um but yes with that comes we do Gets gets a bit technical with genetics and that, but we do outcross them, so we do put them to coated cats, and so we do okay. also have domestic cats that have a pedigree as such, um, cool. domestic-looking cats. How many of those breeders are there in in Cape Town? 
Uh, Cape Town, there's only two now. Um, okay. We're busy helping someone develop as the second breeder. There's, it's just been us for a long time. Because I read that an interview a while ago with a girl whom I called the actress. And the minute she opened her front door, there was a sink running yep. around. My first reaction was, because it just ran past. I, I actually didn't know what I saw. Yes. Because my, my thought was, was that a cat? And then it, it came back. And yes, it was a, it, it was about a 10-week-old at that stage. Yes, yes. But and, and it was the first time I touched one as yes. well. It was such a weird experience. Yes. But what a lovely little animal. It spent, our interview spent lying at my feet. That's why the doors she are closed. So Otherwise, sweet. they would be all over yeah. your computer and your lap. And, um, <laughs> all you'd hear is the purring. So. Well, I've been converted to a cat person. No, so well, <laughs> so, so that would not have been a problem for me. They're yeah, more like a dog, which is great. They come and they're called there. They want attention. They want, you know, they, they can even be trained to do certain things, I guess. But they want attention. So that's... Yeah. Um, but there are some other breeds we are busy researching. And we won't always just have the one breed. But this is... We've been bringing these guys... For probably 10, 12 years. Okay. So this is a, 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 a nearly a diversion, a, a, a kind of just some, something else to, to entertain you and keep you busy. And it started that way. And then now that I judge, and that's also it's a way um, I get to travel around the world and someone else pays, which is something. Love. So we wouldn't, wouldn't normally be able to do that. Mm. I joke I breed the Sphinx because it's the only way I can afford to own one. Um, <laughs> so, um, so many people think we make millions of of rent, but it's not that cost a lot to, to maintain and to keep and to breed. Um, okay. But it's a way we get to keep them and, and have them around. And Fabulous. So, always making a plan. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Listen, this is it. Kind of short and sweet, but it was lovely. Yeah. I really, um, how can I put this? I'm not religious, mm-hmm. but I'm hearing some amazing things from from what I would term religious people, in terms of such an, uh, in my mind, I'm going to call it a new wave way of thinking because I haven't been connected with yep. spiritual spirituality for a very long time in my life. So this is something relatively new for me. So it's really interesting to hear the, again, my interpretation, the developments that happened in terms of spirituality belief systems for the period that I was completely removed from. from yes. Because virtually from the age of 18 to 42, that's yeah. many years yes. that, nice. that, that, that I was just not in touch. And suddenly I, I, I'm becoming in touch again. And it sounds wonderful. That's and it, it sounds really exciting for me. It is. And it's, and it's why there is a move where people are finding that, I, mean, I enjoyed our church has never looked like a church. We've made sure that wherever we are and wherever we're doing it, it says... In fact, my, my dream would actually be to be able to have a nightclub on a Sunday and use that as a church because it's non-threatening. I think the biggest barrier for many people who are coming to church is actually getting through the door and the preconceived ideas they've got from behind yeah. um, or from their, from their past. And it's being able to come in with an fresh approach and just hear the message rather than the method. Yeah. Um, and for us, it's always been about three key words, real, relational, and relevant. Um, and, cool. if it's, and if it's not that, then it's then it's pointless. You know, yeah. if if what we're doing, what we're saying, doesn't fit into those three categories, then well, in my, what are you my, doing? my humble belief, there's no point. You know, yeah. um, it has to meet people where they are. It has to be saying that that speaks to them for who they are. Um, and again, it is challenging at times. There's no, it's it's not always about things being easy. There's some big challenges we face and dealing with things in society and the world that are, are challenging. And at the same time, it's being real and honest about how we feel and what's... And I think there's certain things we don't have the answers to. We know what the answers aren't, but I don't think we quite know <laughs> what the answers are. Yeah. Um, and again, and I think 20 years ago, any, anyone who stood up front and told the church that would be, would be fired because they're supposed to know everything. And I think the nice thing is we've realized now that not, you know, part of this is a journey of understanding and the biggest mistakes we've made is when we've held onto a point that or onto a belief that wasn't fundamentally true you know? yeah. it was just an interpretation or a theory um, so that's one of the big challenges um, but the fact that we're in dialogue and we can talk and we can grow together um, and again for us it needs to be a safe place not a 
um, and it needs to be a place where people feel free to ask questions. Yeah. So we, we've had quite a lot of fun. Um, when, I, when I was doing sermons and preaching, people are allowed to stop and ask a question anytime. Okay. And that's always, always fun. Awesome. Anthony, thank you so very much. Really appreciate your time. And you spend, enjoy the rest of your day. And you're off to Sweden. China and then Sweden. China again? Now I'm back, going back to China next week and then the week after to Sweden. Okay. Awesome. Well, have fun. Thank you. Anthony and I had our talk in the lounge at home. Most of the time during the chat, I was aware of some Sphinx kitten at the door trying to gain access to the room. I think you can hear them at some stage during the conversation. They are so cute. I wanted to put one in my computer bag and make a run for it. It is at times like that when I curse my sense of spirituality. I just know that that is not the right thing to do. As expected, I found Anthony's view on religion very interesting. I loved his view of religion as, and I quote, trying to live by the rules to keep God happy. This is so not in line with how I grew up and my understanding of religion. I'm very grateful for Anthony having spoken to us and wish him all of the best moving forward. If you want to know more about what I do, please feel free to connect with me on my website, which is www.freddy.org.za or find me on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash freddy.org.za or on Twitter at at Rensburg Freddy. Remember that Freddy is always spelt with an IE at the end. I want to thank you for listening. Be safe. Bye.